Connect with IAC, with TCP IP or UDP, and you want to be able to plug it into your standard system with SMP or email or anything else. So there's various ways we can solve this problem. You can use a PLC. They might need a bit more space than what you've got. They usually want to run on a DIN rail. They might have a whole custom suite of software. It might start getting a bit expensive, especially if you want to integrate into a custom system of your own. There's the Arduino, which is a pretty cool little thing, but that doesn't have an operating system really. You just program it up in the C, and then it's effectively get another gadget that you still wouldn't want to. So and this is a Linux conference, so you probably want to get to something that's got Linux exactly. So there's various ways you can do this. You've probably heard of the Raspberry Pi and maybe the Beagle Bone Black. They're um, pretty good with an educational setting though. Um, the Raspberry Pi may have some issues to do with um, power and internet connectivity though, and you want this thing to be pretty reliable, you want to have lots of connectivity. So this is another board, it's called the Carabola 2. And it's about the other bit, and I've got another slide in I'll show you that. It's got the module chip in the middle, the silver bit is the actual computer itself. That runs with Wi-Fi and a whole bunch of things. In this case, it's usually you want to get it attached to a development board unless you want to go and do your own soldering board, board running. The whole swag of GPIO pins, which you can bend to various pieces, we've got USB hosts, and we've got two Ethernet ports which is a very useful thing to have because you've got two Ethernet and you've got Wi-Fi so you can connect it into your existing system without too much trouble and you might be able to chain them together or put it remote or whatever you need to do. <laughs> so it's a very cheap board. I've got these, I, the story here is I had to monitor something at work. Um, we wanted to get into the I squared C. We looked at the Raspberry Pi and some other stuff and I was searching the internet and I stumbled across this place which is actually in Europe. It's a company called Eight Devices. So I've got no vested interest other than I found it, I bought a couple and they actually did the job quite well. And we've got the this works. Um, the specs and the detail. The whole all their information is up at the GitHub site with all the schematics, they've got a wiki, they've got a whole bunch of information. Um, it's all open source, which is really, really handy. And <coughs> As you can see, there's a whole variety of different pinouts that you can use to do this with. It's not the most powerful of boards, it's only a 400 megahertz chip and you know, a beagle bone has got a gigahertz and so on. But what we're doing, we don't need graphics and one thing with the Raspberry Pi and the beagle bone, we've got HDMI and all this other IO and all this multimedia support here. We can put this thing in the corner somewhere and want to monitor our air conditioner or we want to monitor our solar panel or whatever. So you, you don't want all the fancy stuff, you just want to hit on the end of the Wi-Fi or the end of your wires, on the end of your Ethernet connection and get your information out. That's an Australian 50 cent piece, so that gives you a better idea of the size of this thing, so it's pretty small. So again, you can fly the module just by itself if, you, if you're into rolling a circuit board to connect it to it, doing some real custom stuff if you really want to get the size down. <coughs> Uh, most of the time, though, we just do it with a dev board, which is about forty-five dollars at the time. It might be a little bit more now for the currency. Um, we went to a local person and got them to mold us a couple of three printed boxes for it. You now they sit there monitoring the equipment we've got. Uh, this is just a system diagram of the kind of way you want to use it. So you have your main network set up there. You might have a wireless router. And then you talk to the carabola with web or SMP or email or SSH, whatever you need to do, and monitor some of the internet information out of it. So I said this thing runs on Linux. Uh, we use OpenWRT Linux. We'll probably run other versions of Linux. The carabola has a Linux system on chip in it. So I think you can actually get NetBSD for that as well. Uh, but OpenWRT is the supported one. We've got a fork of OpenWRT on the GitHub. Um, there's a whole suite of packages for it. OpenWRT, if you haven't heard of it, originally came out of the WRT54G router, which was developed by Linksys so about 10 years ago now. It was one of the first at-home wireless routers that you used to connect to the internet. So it started life as a homebrew thing where you have a lot of fun, you buy these routers and you get to the manufacturer's firmware and you put this version of the Windows 
But it's actually a fairly, um, it's actually a well-supported community distro open WRT. They're actually pretty finicky about what they put into it too. Um, I've got a bit of a story there because I have one of these other routers I got from MSY for 20 bucks and I hacked it and I wanted to make it work and it wasn't supported. And I couldn't get it to work with the device drivers for the Ethernet port. So there's another one called DDWRT, so I just cheated and pulled the driver out of that. But they, um, fair enough, they said, we can't let you submit that as a patch because it was just a hack. It scratched my itch, but they like to have a fair bit of quality control, which is actually what you want if you're going to have a COT system to run on the network if you work. You don't really want anyone just chucking in patches just to make it work. So OpenWRT, it's got a large package library that mainly network type packages like Asterisk and SSH and the whole swag of different ones, SNMP, so on and so forth. It has a thing called OPackage, which is a little bit like dpackage, I guess that's where they got the name from, the Debian one, but they have their own packaging system. You can install packages onto the flash of an OpenWRT system, or you can actually direct them onto, say, the RAM disk if you just want to load something down temporarily and experiment with it and then take it off again. It has a thing called UCI, the Unified Configuration Interface, which is a sort of um, integrated mechanism for the configuration files. So instead of having to know which config file for each tool you've got, you just use the UCI tool to set the parameters. So all the network parameters or whichever package you want, you can write a script to set them and commit them and then it updates the config file for you. And all the init scripts know how to parse this stuff. And there's a web interface for it. Uh, I don't really have time for a demo today, so I'll just give you a quick tour. It's definitely Linux. If you log in, you get a pretty handy. They seem to name all the distribution versions after various drinks, which is quite interesting. Um, it's definitely Linux, so you can log into the current molder and you can see all the processes running. This one's not doing a lot, it's just running the Wi Fi connector and NTP and so on. That's not coming up that well on the screen. That's the web interface. It's called Lucy, so it's just the front end for GCI. Which, so all the packages are designed to work with UCI. Like I said, it makes it really easy to build a web interface for it. Uh, it's just another one of the package I already talked about. That. So, for example, if you want to just change your channel on your Wi-Fi, you go in and do one setting, restart stuff, and up it goes. So, you want to use one of these current bowlers with OpenWRT if you want to monitor something with it. So this is important, you want a way of getting it off. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. My preferred method for the way we did it at work was just to use email, it's pretty simple. So you find the package for sending an email and then you bring it into a shell script to do the work. I actually prefer SSMTP, not MSMTP, but then you have to do a source build. Source building is pretty cool, but it's kind of beyond the scope of today, unfortunately. If you want to monitor I squared C, all you need to do is you pick a couple of pins on the Carambola board. You donate, if you know what I squared C is, so is, you can go find it on Wikipedia and there's a whole bunch of stuff on their wiki too, on the OpenWRT wiki. And I squared C is like a bus so you can connect it to the equipment you want to read the status out of, which is what we did. The one that default comes with Carambola, OpenWRT, is good for doing bytes. We actually had to do a custom one in C because we wanted to do the extended messages, but that's all right. Most of the time you don't need to do that. And if you want to monitor GPIO, it's real easy to shell script this as well, because these days the kernel exposes all this into the, syspro, into the um, sysfs. So you can wrap all this stuff into a shell script. So I can say, I want to monitor this pin once every 60 seconds to see whether someone's tripped a switch. And if it's gone high, whoops, I need to send an email or a message into my system and log that event. And then you can just, you know, five lines of shell scripts, you can then whack it in a file in initd and off you go and your carambola is now set to go and send you an event whenever you want to um, find out whether someone's tripped your switch. Then you can go more advanced, there's SNMP, I mean you can get any network package you need just about, this is Linux after all. So, um, I'll just quickly talk about OpenWT's file system. It uses an overlay based file system, so you have a base firmware image that gets put onto the flash and then you have an overlay part which so you can install an upgrade to a package and it goes into the overlay section 
um, I guess it's a union file system is the right word there. Or you can use a USB stick because the Carambola has a USB host. It's probably recommended, especially if you want to do a lot of logging or writing because you don't want to churn through the flash on the main board. Um, and you've got TempFS too, which I mentioned briefly before. So for example, I wanted to do some testing with TCP dump, so I actually installed that into the, into the temp so I could debug the tool I was building. Next time it powered off, it went away, I didn't even have to uninstall it, so that was quite handy. Um, I'm just going to zoom through some of this. There's a, I've got the slides will be up afterwards anyway. You can go and rebuild the entire source to customise it to your ends, to get rid of stuff you don't want, or to add extra packages that Carambola don't give you by default. So I'll just jump through that to what, one of the most important bits, which is if you want to recover from a bad flash. Now I had to do this too. In theory it supports TFTP in its U-boot. Um, I couldn't quite get that to work, so I ended up using a thing called Kermit, which you may not have seen for many years. <laughs> because um, it's supported by its U-boot, and that was really full, really cool. It took a while, it went down to like 2,000 bytes a second, but yeah, because I forgot to mention the Carambola has a USB serial port, so you just plug it in, uh, go in and repair your flash, and off you go. So you can also build it for x86 if you want to just play with it in a virtual machine. Um, good way to experiment while you're waiting for your board to rock up. And I think that's pretty close to time. I have one minute left, there you go. So it's um, a cool system. I found it solved my job. Um, you might find it useful. So yeah, thanks. Hey, Jason. Uh, just, uh, you mentioned compiling <laughs> it on another, on your case, on your PC or something. Can you touch on that? Yeah. Um, oh, OK. I jumped through all that, but I might just quickly, quickly, if I can find it. Basically, what happens is the build system downloads everything off the internet. It's a bit like Gen 2. So you clone the GitHub for OpenWRT, and then in a couple of lines of code, you say make. You tell it what set of packages you want. It actually downloads all the source for GCC and GDB and builds a cross-compiled toolchain for your target, whether it's MIPS or ARM or x86. Then it downloads the other packages that you actually want to build your firmware out of, and then it builds them using the built one. So it's like a two-stage Gen 2 kind of thing. It's really quite powerful, but you'd need a whole hour to go through it. So. Yes, yes, it's designed to be an access point. Like it, it, I, I guess they're, they're, they're selling use cases. It's got two Ethernet ports in a switch or a separate ones and Wi-Fi. So it's for like doing your own custom access point. Um, but it's got a whole bunch of GPIO, <laughs> which is what we use it for. Did you look at any of the sort of commercially available router hardware, like the WDR4300s or the, the, the sort of ones that are basically the Carambola but off the shop shelf? Yeah, well, that's where OpenWT sort of came from, is where you ditch the manufacturer's firmware and place it. Um, we wanted um, the really tiny size, and we wanted a board that was produced to be um, a commercial off-the-shelf thing for this, rather than hacking something, because from month to month, you don't know what's going to be inside of the, um, the next WRT or whatever. So, um, And part of this, all the schematics are all on their website and everything. So if we wanted, we could have taken that module and put it in our own circuit. Oh, yep. Can you use the MS Notify to tell you if the GPIO is in a change state? Oh, I'm pretty sure you can. It's got the full Linux 3. Point latest kernel in it, so um, we just didn't bother. Like, you, you know, I guess you know, time is money, I suppose. So, but yeah, it's got well, pretty much anything Linux can do, you can do. I think that's it. <laughs>